City, on Broadway. Slicing straight through the heart of Manhattan. More than any street in the world, Broadway is synonymous with showbiz, glamour, and spectacle. If your dream is to be rich or famous, you're bound to end up on Broadway. Many of the world's greatest stars have made their mark here. In a city that is already larger than life, everything on Broadway is billed as the biggest, the brightest, and the best. Broadway, the heart of New York, the most spectacular stage in the world. On September 9th, 1941, the U-boats attacked their first merchant ship. Usually, the first thing you would know about the attack would be a ship being torpedoed. It's usually a merchantman, not you. You're going faster than they are. Yours comes later. <laughs> we just heard the bang. She went up in flames. We knew that we were in trouble. Because you'd get a ship going one part of the convoy, the escorts would dash down there and they would get someone else on the other side of the convoy. And they were blowing up every few minutes because the submarines, they weren't afraid of us. A Corvette on the surface couldn't go as fast as a submarine could go on the surface. Dernitz had ordered three more U-boats to the scene, and scenting blood, they now attack. Then they got braver and braver, and then they came to the surface in the daylight. And they uh, went down between the lines of the ships and firing their torpedoes and their guns. For three days, the U-boats continue their remorseless attacks. They sink some 15 ships and kill more than 200 seamen, nearly a third of the entire convoy's crew. As I was approaching it, I heard wind chimes. Well, it was a sound like wind chimes, but it was every conceivable tone you could imagine. It was awesome. I also heard hymns being sung, and the hymns were being sung simultaneously, but you could hear each individual one. Now, that sounds totally ridiculous, but there was a great harmony about this tone, and it was uh, liquid silvery it was uh beautiful and this tone permeated all it was in the it. garden setting and i looked down into a valley and at the end of the valley i saw this mountain and, uh, there was a tremendous uh waterfall it was beautiful and the water just cascaded down over this down the mountainside And to the left, there was like a vortex of light, like a tunnel of light. And I knew that that was home where I'd come from. It's really not the light that, that impressed me. It was, it was the feeling. Uh, it was a feeling of peace, uh, gentleness, at oneness with, with the universe, if you please, or with life, with everything. Suddenly I'm floating back in that sky. Suddenly I'm at that moment where everything ends, but everything's there. And just heaven on earth.
back in the late 60s and early 70s, there were women who were very successful. I mean, Joni Mitchell is an obvious example, but there was Buffy Samory, who was prominent for quite some time. There was Sylvia, of Ian and Sylvia. In those days, one of the major centers for folk music was Toronto, in a midtown neighborhood known as Yorkville Village. Like Greenwich Village in New York and Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, it was a scene witness to the transformation of a culture in which music played a major part. It was here at coffee houses like the New Gate of Cleve and the Penny Farthing that artists like Joni Mitchell played sets that combined the old English ballads, the folk hits of the day, and her own first self-conscious attempts at songwriting. Everything was changing. I mean, it wasn't like something was changing only in Yorkville. It was a reflection of the whole world changing. I mean, women were feeling their oats, and that was something new. There was a golden age where, like, Yorkville really was about the music and the clubs. I had an apartment upstairs here. Joni Mitchell lived two doors down from me over there. Neil Young had a place back there. Johnny Kay was Steppenwolf. All those bands played up and down this street here. Clubs like the, the Penny Farthing and the El Patio. Uh, folk clubs. Like the Troubadour in Los Angeles and the Bitter End in New York, it was the riverboat in Yorkville that was regularly witnessed to music history in the making in the intimate setting of a club. I would sit there night after night at that little club, the riverboat, watching Joni Mitchell. Or you'd see Neil Young after the Buffalo Springfield broke up when he was just, didn't know what to do with himself, so he just, with his acoustic guitar, was playing clubs. And Neil Young, post Buffalo Springfield, playing in the riverboat. One day, it just became people cruising in from the burbs and gazoonies coming down to pick up girls and yelling at a car windows, and suddenly, you know, people having fist fights, you know, in the, on the side. And it was like, just like that, and it, it happens when places get discovered and then all the people that kind of made it happen all just go poof and disappear. They came along and cleaned it up and made it very fashionable and boutique-y, and of course all the musicians moved to L.A. and New York. father's hand to show him that I have to be brave to go learn to be a white man. Shirley Chichu is an actress, a writer, and artist. In the summer and autumn of 1991, she presented her one-woman show, Path with No Moccasins, based on her experiences as a child in the residential school system. It is a subject now finding its place in the themes of many other Native artists. These schools were the principal means by the government to enforce a policy of assimilation on Native people, whom federal authorities believed to be barbaric and pagan. In fact, the inferior quality of the schools, run by the churches, was a means of depriving Native children of culture, language, custom, and eventually identity. sisters at the window looking out at my mom and my other sisters at the station and she was just crying. I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And there was nobody to take us to the boarding school. I was nine and Jeannie was seven. And I remember that god awful hurt. And you know that, that hurt and that loneliness was to stay with me all my life. The Mounties came and caught us. We were playing in a tent, I remember that. And they just put us in the, in the car and off we went. From there we got on a horse buggy and then down to the rest of the school. And then that's when I start screaming my head off, I guess. They separated us, eh? I was holding on to Stella, she was older. Eh? separated us and we're just screaming. So from on there, I lived there for eight years straight. I remember the, the residential school as being cold and black and white. <laughs> the nuns were in their habit and everything seemed uh, sterile. It was a, a sterile environment. 
I can remember kids coming in <clears throat> from Moose Factory and way up north, the Aklavik, little children, and they couldn't speak a word of English. And as soon as they went to speak their language, they got whippings and strappings. You know, they take away everything from you in there. They deprogram you. They try to turn you right into a white person. Tony Duran is one of the world's most sought-after celebrity and fashion photographers, snapping the likes of Brad Pitt, Meg Ryan, Sharon Stone, and J-Lo with his erotically charged and sophisticated images. Now he's stepping out from behind the lens at the first ever showing of his work. This is the coming out party. And he wants the opening party to be the most talked about and glitzy A-list bash in Hollywood. But with only a precious few days to organize it, the pressure is on and the stakes are high as Tony is financing the event all by himself. What I don't want is anybody sitting for the next 12 hours waiting for something to do. And we have an all-access VIP pass to see if Tony and his team can pull it off. There's about 80 pictures that aren't here right now. I'm Nick Chase. I'm a full-time glass studio resident here at Harborfront Center, and I specialize in blown and engraved glass. A lot of where I get my texture from is from like eroded objects or like weathered, beaten objects. It's all like your experience. My leaf series with the leaves on the vessels, it's kind of the same sort of thing, growth on, on an object and just the beauty in it. And when I started my leaf vessels, I was using really decayed images of leaves. So when I'd apply them, there was a bit of a relationship between decay and the leaf itself. You didn't really know whether it was a leaf or it was like chip paint or decay off the vessel or not. So that's kind of how it ties in. The images I use of the leaves and stuff, they're not always perfect. Little pieces will blow off here and there and I'll get a little inconsistency so it'll look like it's decaying itself. And it's a little accident, but it's, it's beauty in its own. To start a piece, you basically start with a blowpipe. Uh, you gather in the furnace. We have a 300 pound pot furnace. It's a big crucible full of glass. When you start the piece, it's like really molten. Depending on how big you want the piece, you add more glass to it. You can add color right off the bat or at the end of it. And once you have all your glass, you start blowing the piece out, forming it. Blow the, the shape. It's a really simple shape when it's hot. There is a certain time frame you have to work with the piece, but you can work for hours on a glass piece. You're constantly reheating it, reshaping it and stuff like that.